It is 1-8 of 2015. We're going to take a look at Acts 6 and 7. And it is the most important two chapters of the entire book of Acts. Although some might argue that Acts 17, where Paul preached in the uh, Plato's Academy, might also be a great chapter also, it still doesn't uh, overshadow 6 and 7 and the uh, story of Stephen, and especially Stephen's message to the Sanhedrin. That is the core, these two chapters are the core interpretive chapters of all of the book of Acts. And so we're going to jump right straight in. We'll start at 6, uh, 1 to 7.53. And that's going to be a, where we begin with a, Stephen is a, selected as the first deacon in the church. And he is a, described as a, an individual who is a plerais pistis, plerais pistis, abounding in the faith. So he's considered the uh, the one person in all of the first church of all the they had thousands of believers talking about a lot of people. He's considered the one who is most Christ-like, a very uh, a very dedicated Christian. He's selected as the first deacon to handle very practical matters of distribution of food, to make sure that everyone in the church has their needs met for food and shelter, which was a, a huge concern during a time when there was a lot of poverty. It's a very uh, important position, and only someone who could really be trusted and someone who is really rooted in the gospel and in the mind of Christ could take on that position, and that was Stephen. But what's interesting is that this is a special time of the dispensation of power, and the apostles have been especially gifted, more so than we understand the power of the Holy Spirit today, there seemed to be at that time a, a, a dunamis megas, which is an overflowing of divine power that was given in an anointing in a spirit baptism to the apostles. What's interesting is that after Stephen is selected, uh, Peter and the apostles anoint him with the dunamis megas power through a laying on of hands. So there's a laying on of hands of uh, Peter especially, on to Stephen to uh, transfer this uh, dunamis megas power to Stephen also. And in verse 8, we're told by Luke that Stephen did perform signs and wonders after he uh, received this uh, this plerais dunamis, this uh, overfilling of the spiritual power from God. And he performed a Luke's term again, signs and wonders. He was also, like the apostles, even as a deacon, he was one who performed signs and wonders. He performed healings and uh, true sign moments in the community that were recognized as this must be the power of God. So he had that ability. He had that uh, power, and he received, received it as an, an anointing from Simon Peter through the laying out of hands. So it was a Obviously a very visible outward act, but it wasn't just symbolic. There was really a substantial transfer of power during the first century. During the birth of the church, this power was very much a real transfer of power. So it, not just a symbolic act, not, uh, not a symbolic baptism, but a baptism of power and of teaching. So we find in 6, 1 through 8 that Stephen was selected, appointed, and anointed with the dunamis power. Now in 9 through 15, we, uh, Luke gives us the third persecution of the uh, organized Judaic faith, the Sanhedrin. The third persecution is uh, directed towards Stephen. Uh, a dispute is raised up against Stephen, uh, a group of a uh, Jewish leaders uh, gathered together to oppose Stephen. There was actually an organized opposition against him. And uh, 
but they had great difficulty challenging him because he, uh, Luke says, even to those who dared to oppose him, they had to recognize that the uh, Sophia Numatikas was present in his demeanor and everything he did in his count- countenance. He possessed a uh, spiritual Sophia wisdom, not gnosis wisdom, not uh, not doctrine, but the wisdom of the heart, the wisdom of the soul, the wisdom of a of conviction and motivation. He had a depth of Sophia wisdom uh, to the very depth of the soul and psyche that they could not stand up against. They had to just give in to it. So even though they would organize as a group against Stephen, Luke tells us that he possessed the Sophia Pneumatikas, the Sophia spirituality, a wisdom that is really the wisdom of conviction, the motivational conviction of being dedicated to Jesus Christ. So he truly was filled and overfilled with the faith and filled to the very depth of his convictions and very much possessed this Sophia wisdom. Now, during this time, <clears throat> we know this is the Pentecost time, and everyone's con- everyone is concentrating on Moses. Uh, there, it's really a, it's almost a festival of honoring Moses. It's not even a, uh, an honoring of Abraham, really. It really was geared toward being a festival, a feast of honoring Moses and the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. So everyone has on their mind Moses, 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 Mount Sinai, the giving of the law, the Mosaic covenant, not the Abrahamic covenant, but the covenant with Moses. And uh, this group that uh, conspired against Stephen, in verse 11, we see that Luke tells us that they said in their accusation that uh, they finally just said, this Stephen is speaking blasphemy against Moses and God. Well, right there, that's like the ultimate accusation at that time because everyone would be uplifting the name of Moses. So he was uh, taken into custody. He appeared before the Sanhedrin uh, Jerusalem Council. The Jerusalem Council of, of uh, Jewish elders was called the Sanhedrin. They were a senate body of leadership for the temple and for the faith. They had a great deal of power, uh, a tremendous amount of power. And so Stephen is dragged before the Sanhedrin Council, the Jerusalem Council of the Sanhedrin. And uh, in verse 13, he is accused of also, they said, blasphemy against Moses. But now when they get him in front of the Sanhedrin, they modify their accusation. They say, we accuse him of speaking against the temple and the law. See, at, in front of the Sanhedrin, they wanted to bring the temple into it because the Sanhedrin was the Senate in charge of the temple. So now they want to really lay it on the line, that, hey, he's, he's, he's uh, speaking against you, Sanhedrin. He's speaking against the temple. So now he's accused of speaking against the temple and the law and saying that Jesus Christ brings about a change of customs. Well, the word used is... Uh, Alaso, alaso ethos. And alaso ethos is a, a transformation of customs. And that is a, not really out of line with what was going on. So he's accused of this, uh, of teaching a transformation of customs. And, uh, but he still had that countenance like an angel, Luke says, and he still had that uh, Sophia wisdom of spirit to the very depth of his soul, and he was very difficult to go up against because he was true. Whether you disliked him or not, you were uh, very much convicted that this was a man dedicated to God. So. Uh, Stephen offers a response to this accusation of speaking against the temple, and it's in a, a, a beautiful presentation. We're going to look at, we move into chapter 7, 1 through 53, and uh, it's lengthy because he presents the entire 
Moses' narrative to lead into his argument. But he begins with a a five-point foundation for his core message. And he begins uh, in verses 1 through 30. He narrates the Pentecost story that they're celebrating of Moses receiving the law on Mount Sinai. So he begins with what they're celebrating, Moses receiving the law. And then he says, Moses was confirmed as a spiritual leader through the display of signs and wonders in verse 36. And then he moves in, moves on to say that Moses himself did prophesy of the coming Christos Messiah. Moses prophesied of this coming Christos. And under Moses, Stephen says, the tabernacle was instituted, the uh, enclosure for the glory of God. And then he goes on to say, and then after Moses, we even have an individual uh, a building project under Solomon where they built this fantastically ornate, huge structure of a Solomon's temple, which was like the ideal temple of all time, again, as an enclosure for the glory of God. So that's his base. He said, that's what we have done in the past. We have uh, had Moses who did display signs and wonders, and we had the tabernacle instituted as an enclosure for God, and we had the Solomon's Temple as an enclosure for God's glory. But he says all of this just to lead into his core message, and his core message is the heart of the book of Acts. And if you want to make a note of this, it's chapter 7, 48 to 53. Chapter 7, 48 to 53. If you can get your head around that, that is the core interpretive window for the entire book of Acts. And uh, he has seven points to his core message. He says, uh, number one, that God does not dwell in any man-made structure that's, that's made by the hands of human beings. God does not dwell in a man-made tabernacle or a man-made temple. And then he goes on in verse 49 and he says, what kind of a re- residence could you build anyway that could actually contain God. You can't build a karapa'au, a a residence, the Greek word for residence. You can't build a residence of any type that could contain God. And then he goes on to say in 50 that God is the creator of all creation. All things have been created by God. And then in 51, he looks right at the Sanhedrin and he strikes a blow with the rebuke, the criticism. And in verse 51, he says, you, ha- you have uncircumcised hearts. You may be living accord- according to the outward appearance of the law, but you don't have love in your heart. You don't have an uncircumcised heart. So he says, because of this, you're resisting the Holy Spirit. You're not uh, welcoming the Holy Spirit that's being given. You're resisting it. You betrayed Jesus Christ. You gave him over to the cross, verse 52. And you have failed to keep the fulfillment of the law, which was which was through the coming of this Jesus Christ that you crucified. So he gives them uh, like four spiritual rebukes right in a row. And then he uh, concludes by saying that the doxa glory of God has not re-entered the temple because the temple now is spiritual and not made by mortar and stone. And circumcision is spiritual also. So he's radically telling the Sanhedrin that they failed to recognize the transformation of the covenant as it was delivered through Jesus of Nazareth, the one they crucified. So he says, you didn't recognize the transformation. Uh, You didn't recognize that the temple is not something to contain the glory of God. The glory of God, the doxa glory of God, cannot be contained. So this is a huge rebuke to the Sanhedrin. So rather than defending himself, he says, I haven't sinned, you have sinned, and not recognizing that the covenant did undergo transformation in Jesus Christ. The covenant did undergo transformation because 
Jesus Christ taught that God is spirit and we worship God in spirit. You can't contain him in a rock wall and then put up curtains to contain him even more. You can't keep taking the glory of God and putting it further back and further back into the temple and then build up a whole community of priests and and they become another wall. You can't just keep closing in the glory of God. You can't contain the docks of glory of God. You cannot, No matter what you build, no matter how beautiful a temple you build, the temple is spiritual and you cannot contain God's docks of glory. You are a Sanhedrin with an uncircumcised heart. You do not, do not have the love of God in your hearts. Huge rebuke. Huge rebuke. And, of course, we all know the result of that, because Stephen becomes the first martyr of the church. But uh, we pick up the stoning of Stephen in 754 through 60. And uh, the Sanhedrin, again, Luke uses the term cut to the heart. They were cut in two with indignation towards Stephen. They ground their teeth together, ground their teeth together in anger, and they uh, more or less uh, aggressively just wanted to do away with him or, or uh, to murder him and execute him for his what they considered blasphemy, but uh, more especially because he was criticizing the temple, and they were the temple authority, the Sanhedrin. But uh, Luke records Stephen's vision. During this attack, Stephen has a vision, and Luke gives it basically in three points. He says that he looked up into the Uranos, into the heavens, the Uranos. He saw the doxa, theu, he saw the doxa, glory of God, that the Jews were waiting for. He looked up into the Oranos heavens and saw the doxa, glory, and he saw Jesus Christ out of Nazareth, the Jesus of Nazareth, exalted to the right hand of God as the Kyrios Lord. So he sees doxa, glory, and he sees the glory coming together in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, who was awakened and raised up out of Nazareth, and uh, the same uh, Jesus of Nazareth, who the Sanhedrin executed, turned over to be executed on the cross. And this Jesus is the curious Lord of all creation. He is the one exalted on high. He is at the right hand of the Father. So Luke records the vision. And, you know, that's interesting because you can record his words that he that he has, you know, when he addresses the Sanhedrin, but uh, Luke records the vision, and then uh, the Sanhedrin cast him out of the city, and they're going to stone him, and they are all of a one accord, and they actually uh, aggressively they use a hormao or to hasten upon Stephen, and they are all of one a uh, one passion, murderous passion. They are all of one mind and execute Stephen. So there's no variance or anything. And Saul, who was present, that means Saul endorsed, according to Luke, and this is Luke's friend. Luke's friend was Paul. But according to this testimony given by Luke, Saul fully endorsed murdering Stephen. He fully endorsed this is, and this is Saul, what a Pharisee, not a Sadducee that believed in capital punishment, but a Pharisee who did not believe in capital punishment, but Saul fully endorsed the uh, stoning of Stephen. And that's in verse 58. So Luke is putting this in his letter. And remember, this letter is a letter going, uh, going out probably to Philippi, to Little Rome, because... A lot of commentators feel that he is addressing Philippi here. He had ministered there with Paul. And at the writing of Acts, Paul is arrested and in Rome and uh, awaiting the verdict for his own execution. And Luke is trying to write 
in a way, an apologetics or in a, def a defense of Paul where he can get some kind of leniency in Rome. And he figures he might be able to do that by writing to Philippi because Philippi was a retirement community for retired military Roman soldiers. So there was a lot of people in Philippi who could speak to people in Rome and maybe get a little bit of leniency for Paul uh, of some sort. And so Luke mentions now, look, this is how he started. He started being very zealous toward persecuting Christians, and he was present at the stoning of Stephen. Now in verse 59 and 60, we get to uh, the final words that Stephen offers up, and he offers up uh, very specifically in 59, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So not Father, receive my spirit, not Lord God of Abraham, or don't, or receive me unto the arms of Abraham, because the Jews felt that they would be taken up into the arms of Abraham. But he lets it be known verbally that Jesus is the authority now. Jesus is the Lord over all creation, the Lord over heaven and earth, the Lord over the Uranus and the earth. And so he speaks out loud. He, it says he cried out in verse 59, Lord Jesus, Kyrios, Iesu, so Kyrios, Lord Jesus, receive and welcome my spirit. And he uses spirit here, not not suke, not not psyche, not soul. He uses spirit. So he goes, Lord Kyrios, Jesus, receive and welcome my spirit. And then he prayed for his oppressors, and he said, uh, Please do not count this as a hamartia sin against them. And then uh, Luke says, and then he uh, gave up the spirit and died. Koimao means to give up the breath and die. So he, uh, in a way, it uh, kind of duplicates uh, Christ on the cross. But you've got this, you've got Stephen saying, Lord Jesus, please receive my spirit. I commend unto you my spirit. But it is the Lord who has been appointed to authority now over heaven and earth. And then he prays for his oppressors and then gives up uh, the breath, gives up his spirit and dies. But it is important to Luke to mention in this that uh, that uh, the person you have imprisoned in Rome is this same Saul. This is where Saul started. And he, uh, when he ministered in Philippi, he was a changed person. He made a complete reverse course, a complete turnaround from the being out of place with the the intention of God. And he did uh, minister to the people in Philippi, but it is the same Saul who uh, later was converted on the way on the road of Damascus. So it's very important to uh, Luke to mention to uh, the audience in Philippi that Saul was part of this uh, persecution and execution of Stephen, where Stephen was someone completely filled with the uh, Sophia wisdom of the Lord, and uh, his countenance reflected that uh, he had that uh, overflow of faith, that, uh, that very depth of conviction concerning the mind of Christ considered a, the most Christ-like person in the early church. and that, So that's really the core. If you wanted to really highlight the, uh, the core section of Scripture for the book of Acts, it's going to be chapter 7, verse 48 to 53. Chapter 7, verses 48 to 53, the seven-point core message of Stephen to the Sanhedrin. The seven point core message to the Sanhedrin, 748 to 753. And that'll wrap up this section that takes us up to the beginning of chapter 8.